Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 27. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, I'm Amanda Lowry, finalist in the Extreme Hunters Contest. This is Boyd Barnett with Moultrie Products and the Moultrie Total Game Management Podcast. This is Dean Vanier with Northwoods Common Sense. This is Rob Lucas from Chasing Tail. Tim Moore from TimMoreOutdoors.com, the New Hampshire Sea Coast Guide. This is Nathan Biggs with Brow Time Productions. So you're listening to the Big, Big Buck, Buck Registries Big, Big Buck, Buck Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast, and I am here with my field correspondent from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, Dusty? You know, the Temperatures are starting to warm up here in Ohio a little bit, uh, calling for 50 degrees over the weekend. So snow's melting, and uh, I think the uh, fair weather hunters may be back in the woods. Oh, no kidding. Are you uh, are you guys still hunting in Ohio? Yes, we are. Uh, we're here till February with the hunting season, archery. i uh, got a late muzzleloader coming up, so that's uh, something to look forward to for the Buckeye hunters. And what's going on in New Hampshire? Man, you guys have it so good down there. It's, uh, it's like Mecca. Uh, of deer hunting in Ohio because our deer season is completely over, including the the archery season. Done for the year. Done. December uh, 15th, it, the gun season ends one week prior to the end of the, the archery season, and archery season ended December 15th. Wow. So now we just turn to predator hunting, if you like to do that, and ice fishing, basically. Awesome. You know, predator hunting and ice fishing, that's not too bad either. It's not too bad, but you know I'd rather be hunting the deer. For for sure. You know, there's nothing better than seeing that big rat coming through the woods. Wow. So you guys go up to February 1st? Yeah, it's the 4th, if I ain't mistaken. Oh, that's awesome. I could be mistaken. Don't take me for granted on that. I don't know the exact date. I need to look. That's all right. No big deal. Um, so we have, uh, we have a pretty cool show today. This is a little more serious than we usually do this. Um, but I thought it was a very interesting topic and, and this is more, you know, more me than you. I know you, you, uh, consider me more the serious side of this whole thing. You know, but, uh, it's going to be very informal for our listeners. And that, yeah. that's kind of where it, it's something that we need to get out there. Absolutely. And I got a, I got an email from Edison Waite, our good friend from Buckmasters, the, the master scorer there. Um, and the, the email came, it was entitled, entitled wildlife and the outdoors. And it was written, there was this article written about how gun and ammunition sales affect state game and fish agencies. And it was written by a guy by the name of Jeff Mackinson, who is a certified wildlife biologist from the Alabama division of wildlife and freshwater fisheries. And lo and behold, there was a phone number attached at the bottom of the, the website, and I gave him a call. And I got a hold of Jeff Mackinson to speak to us about the details of his article that he wrote. And it's really all about where the money comes from to support fish and game agencies and conservation efforts and how the money actually gets there from the federal level. You know, and that that's something that we want uh, everybody to listen to this podcast and, and get familiar with where the fundings come from. Right. And it's something we take for granted. It's something we don't even really even think about when we buy a package of bullets or something when we buy a new gun, we buy a hunting license. I don't think we really think about it that much. Um, but after listening to Jeff, and, and we did pre-record the, the show with him, so we're going to play it for you. But what's interesting is to think about how few deer there were in the country in 1937 and where they are today, the, the entire population of the deer in Alabama in 1937 was about 2,000. Uh, if it wasn't for these folks, we wouldn't be hunting white deer. Correct. And we wouldn't have this this podcast, and there wouldn't be a hunting industry. There wouldn't there be wouldn't, hunting shows. There wouldn't be the Duck Dynasty. There wouldn't be Chasing Tail. There wouldn't be anything on TV about hunting deer. Zero. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Zero. So when you think about this, just give a little thanks to this Restoration Act because because this whole show, the whole purpose of the Big Buck Registry, would not exist today. It wouldn't be here, folks. All right, all right. Let's let's call him up. Let's talk to Jeff. Thanks for joining us. I do appreciate you spending some time with us to go over uh, the article that you wrote. And the the article that you wrote was how gun and ammunition sales affect state game and fish agencies. Yes, sir. And 
I'd like to get into that whole article a little deeper um, and understand what that's all about. It's kind of interesting to know where money comes from for the state fish and game agencies and going through your article is quite interesting, but I'd like to let you tell the story. Sure, sure. Well, I, I manage uh, a 45,000 acre uh, public hunting area in Alabama, and uh, I, I can remember unloading a, a shipment of seed that was about $3,000 worth of seed for our fall planting for um, for wildlife, and the truck driver said, you mean I paid for all this? And I said, uh, well, sir, do you um, do you hunt? Uh, he said, well, I used to, but I hadn't hunted in years. And I said, have you bought any guns or ammunition lately? He said, no, not lately. I said, well, you didn't pay a dime for this. And he looked at me <laughs> funny, and, and uh, I said, uh, you know, General taxpayer dollars are not used to support wildlife conservation in most states, uh, and it's certainly the case in Alabama. Uh, and uh, I think there's a big misconception out there about about where agencies get their monies. And uh, uh, the Pittman Robertson Act is, uh, I mean, it, it was a historical act that uh, restored wildlife populations and currently continues to manage them throughout the nation. Gotcha. And it, it was passed in 1937. Okay, uh, Jeff, you're a you're a biologist, right? Certified wildlife biologist with the Alabama Division of Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries. Yes, sir. That's Excellent. correct. Um, so tell me more about the night, the Act of 1937. Well, why was it put in place? Well, presidents, legislators, landowners, sportsmen throughout the nation were concerned that their children and grandchildren weren't going to have wildlife populations to hunt. Uh, and uh, that was the primary reason, though. Uh, you know, sportsmen got behind it and lobbied for it, and it was passed in, in, uh, in 1937. And the area that I managed was established in 1938. It was the first wildlife management area in Alabama. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, and it was the second place in our state to receive stocking of white-tailed deer. Uh, you know, wildlife populations were we're dwindling throughout the nation, uh, uh, and it's it's a great success uh, conservation story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you think now in Alabama alone that we will take, we harvest, we will kill as many white-tailed deer in one year than we're in the whole nation in 1900. Um, that, that's a huge success story, that's that we're able to manage this resource, you know, without abusing it. We're just, you know, keeping it healthy, and uh, it will be there for generations to enjoy for years to come. There are a couple things you just said there that are kind of interesting. The first is that the, the area that you manage was established in 1938, which was not long after the act was put in play. That's right. And, and just so uh, our listeners can, can hear it, is the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act 1937. Yes, sir. That's correct. Usually called the Pittman-Robertson Act. That's how, how you had wrote it or written it. Named after Sen- Senator Key Pittman of Nevada. Yes, sir. And Representative Absalom. Is that what it is? Absalom. That's how, that's, that's how I would say it. <laughs> Absalom Willis Robertson of Virginia. So basically in 1937, or prior to 1937, in 1935-36, so there was a, a crisis of wildlife going on in the United States. Is that accurate? Uh, a- absolutely. Um, you know, many species were on the brink of extinction uh, that, that we continue to enjoy today. Uh, you know, the Rocky Mountain mule deer, there, there's just a number of species that were just almost completely wiped out. Because prior to that, you know, we had the sale of hunting license, and that was just a, that's just a small portion of what's needed to... Uh, um, to enforce regulations, and there were no biologists practically uh, in the nation then working with state agencies, helping to manage the populations. And uh, uh, but you know they were gone. I mean, we had two thousand deer in nineteen hundred in Alabama. Uh, two, and two, now we have about one point seven million. Two thousand deer were left on, in Alabama in nineteen thirty-seven. Yes, sir. That's that's Holy exactly smokes. right. Dusty, yeah, can we, you imagine we, that? Oh, it sure wouldn't take long to eliminate the deer population at all. Wow. No. What was going on in nineteen? 19- Thirty in the thirties that caused all this. Well, unregulated sport hunting and or primarily market hunting. Um, you know, back then, uh, you know, people lived off what Mother Nature provided for them, uh, and you know, there was no season, no bag limit uh, for the most part in most states. And uh, you know, you got your food by going and grabbing your gun and going to shooting a squirrel or killing possums at night, raccoons. Um, uh, even then, there were hardly no beaver in Alabama uh, mm-hmm. because beaver was a was a popular um, table fare, and uh, of course, the deer were, were wiped out primarily for food. Interesting. So like when you see a movie from the 40s that depicts life in the 30s and 20s, that was pretty accurate. You know, yes. where you're out on the frontier shooting a game to put on your dinner table. It, it was. There was a, the civilization was still developing at that point. That's right. 
That's right. And they, they just survived off the land. And, uh, you know, where you had good rich soil, you were able to farm and, and, and maybe didn't have to quite hunt as much. But uh, even those guys that had the fertile soil and farmed a lot still still needed meat on the table. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a tough life. Gotcha. But I, I think I would have actually enjoyed it back then. But anyhow. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's definitely some elements of that, that day and time that is very appealing to me and to you and to Dusty that, you know, it's like a rawness to your survival. It's kind of the things that I think we partake, that's reasons we partake in hunting today is because we like that tradition. We like to feel like, uh, it's, it's often overlooked. Very much so. You know, the, the meat on the table, that was the whole purpose of hunting and back in the day. Right. Now today we have some grocery stores and stuff like that, but now it's, it's almost like a, a lifestyle choice to go out and hunt and, and put, um, free range organic meats on your table instead of going to the grocery store and buying stuff that's wrapped in cellophane. You know, that it's just, um, but back then that was a necessity. You, that's, that was one of the ways in which you survived as a human. It was. That's exactly right. And I think there's a big misconception out there that, you know, a lot of wildlife species are made game animals simply to, uh, to ensure their, uh, their survival. Uh, and that, that raises a lot of eyebrows, but, uh, uh that's a fact. Uh, you know, if it's better managed, better regulated, if it's a game species, uh, it's like our black bear, it's still a considered a game animal in Alabama, but, but there's no, there's no open season on it. Right. Uh, but we're able to, we're able to use and use funds to help manage and restore that population. Gotcha. So the, the area that you manage, it was 450,000 acres did i hear you correctly it, it's forty five thousand acres i manage it with the partnership of the of the u.s forest service yes sir. gotcha and that area was the second place in alabama to receive funds is that, is that accurate yes sir okay that, that, that was the second place it was the first management area established and it was the second place um, to receive stocking of whitetail deer see i mean there wasn't any deer back then and so we had with our deer most of the deer on my area came from um, pisgah north carolina and, uh, you know, we brought deer in here from other parts to restore their population. Gotcha. And once the population could support some hunting, uh, you know, and, and antler season was, um, was, was allowed, uh, a fairly short one, but, and, and some years later, you know, we started allowing some antlerless harvest. Gotcha. This but is very, about, very interesting. So the, the deer that were, that were stocked, uh, came from, did you say Pisgah, North Carolina? That's right. Yes, sir. P-I-S-G-A-H. That's correct. Interesting. Um, so what was going on in Pisgah, North Carolina that, that, allowed for some deer to be moved was was there a better management going on there at that time i think it was a, a more remote area and it was again was a big national forest land so they came off of a national forest gotcha. and um, you know it, it, evidently there wasn't as many people as hungry in north carolina as there were in alabama maybe maybe they were eating all bear up there letting the deer go i don't know about that. <laughs> gotcha, right. um, but we talk about deer i mean the pronghorn antelope uh, you know 70 years ago there was twelve thousand. now we've got a million uh, the wild turkey, a hundred thousand. Then we got over four and a half million. Mm. Uh, you know, Rocky Mountain elk, forty-one thousand in nineteen oh seven. You know, now there's there's uh, close to a million. Um, so I mean, th- there's a number of successful uh, success stories that go along with the Pippin Robertson Act, and uh, and and that's all those monies can be used for. And uh, uh, thanks to gun sales that have, have dramatically increased in the in the last uh, six years or so, and uh, uh, states have uh, have received more funding gotcha. uh, to do wildlife conservation and management and we in Alabama we operate about 36 state wildlife management areas over 700,000 acres on the Pittman Robertson Act annually wow uh, yeah, I think you know, I think it, we almost take it for granted. Like you know, there's so many deer that we chase every single season, but it, we don't r- realize that this there was, there was this thing going on back in 1937. And if that didn't get corrected, we wouldn't be hunting anything right now. That, that's you know that's exactly right. I mean, there'd still be a few people chasing squirrels uh, right. and raccoons, but uh, gosh, uh, you know, white-tailed deer drives uh, you know drives our state. Uh, you know, not not only direct individuals that hunt, but uh, but individuals that come here and, and, and stay a week or two and hunt and stay in motels and this uh, uh, there's an awful lot of money that's spent throughout the nation and other states uh, and about 80 percent of our hunters uh, uh, will hunt whitetail deer right now that's what they prefer to hunt right well it's kind of interesting i mean if you think about where the deer ha- have gone from 2,000 deer in alabama to the numbers that you have i mean i think of Al- alabama today tons and tons of wildlife yes sir you're exactly right it, it's a great time to be a hunter in alabama Alabama and really throughout the nation. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this this is just one state we're taking the snapshot look at, but uh, you know, other states are are, are um, in, uh, are blessed like we 
are. But right. uh, you know, we 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 do have a lot of physiographic regions in Alabama, a lot of different habitat types, and uh, it's one of the most diverse states in the nation. And uh, uh, we're we're very blessed. And and you know, honestly, none of this, even with the Pittman Robertson Act in our state, would have been possible without the support of our private landowners because they own and control about 94% of the land in Alabama. So, mm. you know, if it wasn't for their interest in this, you know, I mean, they'd make the choice that they're going to manage for deer or turkey or other game species, and they're not going to put a trailer park in, or they're not going to put a shopping mall on their property, or, or do other things because they're interested in the management of, uh, of these wildlife mm. resources. So we couldn't do it. We own less public land in Alabama than just about any state in the nation, and uh, without their support, without their help, um, uh, it wouldn't be possible here. And in many other states. It's a very good point. If you think about the the amount of industry that is created around deer hunting because the population of the deer are well supported now. I mean there's it's a massive mega million probably billion dollar industry at this point nationwide. Would you agree? Let's see, the article that I wrote in research, uh, since the implementation of the act, more than $13 billion have been collected and distributed with matching funds from state agencies. So go. in Alabama alone, it's about $1.2 billion annually. Okay, so $1.2 billion come out of this industry. Now, your article described the funds being distributed because of firearm and ammunition sales. Is there more to, to a, is it, is it a tax on the ammunition that we're talking about and the, and the firearms? It is. It's an 11% tax. The tax uh, in 1937, already existed, but uh, but they started earmarking mark- that money um, to the state um, uh, wildlife and fish agencies for, for specific purposes of um, acquiring land, managing and restoring wildlife populations. Gotcha. So at the time, so back up just a sec. When we talk about the Restoration Act, there was a an act to restore wildlife in the United States, but did it have a weakness in funding at that point, and they needed something to tax so that they could fund it? Hey, I... They, they basically just needed needed the money earmarked. You know, they uh, they the tax again was already there. Okay. The, all state agencies had at the time was funds on hunting license sales. Gotcha. And uh, and then and that was just you know back then that that wasn't very much at all. I mean, in Alabama in 1937, uh, you know, most conservation officers again there were no biologists and all, most conservation officers were required to use their own vehicle. They bought their own little sidearm and you know they didn't have any radios. It was just an unorganized, very dangerous uh, field to be in. Right. And, uh, um I would imagine. I mean, if you imagine what it was like being a conservation officer back in 1937 when this thing first went into play. It would be tough. You know, You're changing lifestyles. That, that would so, be tough. Those were some very hardy, very tough individuals, um, and uh, I would imagine that that most of the best officers back then were probably at one time some of the very best outlaws, uh, and uh, at least I've heard stories to that effect. Uh, but the, what's neat about the Pittman Robertson Act is, you know, we talked about management areas and we talked about restoring populations, but it's also built public shooting ranges throughout the nation. Mm-hmm. It's created access for hunting, fishing, and boating, uh, and it's provided funds for wildlife research. I mean, there's specific things that that money has to be used for and can't be used for anything else. Mm -hmm. So it really went from being a a tax on hunting licenses to a tax on a much bigger part of the hunting industry being ammunition and firearms. And it's an 11% tax. 11%. And it's matched on a three to one basis. And, uh, what, what's really important is the states use the honey license sales dollars for that 25% match to get the three to, to get the 75% match initially. Um, so you, again, you have to have, you have to have the match. You have to match it 25% from states were broke. So they, many of them increase honey license sales to get that, to get that monies to match to get their three, three dollars for every dollar. Now, when you say match, you know, where, what are we matching? Where is the money coming from? Department of Interior collects the monies okay. on that on, the, on from the Pittman Robertson Act. Okay, got it. And they they will pool, uh, you know, anywhere from three hundred and fifty to three hundred and sixty or seventy million dollars annually, and they will look at the formula, and it's based on the number of licensed hunters each state has 
size and also on the total forested area of the state. So they look at Alabama and they say, okay, they got they've got uh, 260,000 hunters. Uh, they've got uh, 20.1 million acres. This is the formula. Boom! This is what Alabama gets this year. Fascinating. And, that, and, that, and that's how it's divided up between the states. That's fascinating. So it is, and it you know it works so well. And continues to work so well that they they modeled the Dingle Johnson Act, which does the very same thing with fisheries. Okay. Uh, that's how fisheries departments, state departments, are funded because they they placed an excise tax in the early 50s on fishing equipment, and that finally gave states some monies to start managing their fisheries resource. So. It's a user pay concept, right. and it's good. It's good to see the individuals that are really interested and dedicated to something, uh, paying for it and seeking and, and receiving the rewards from it. Absolutely. So I'm in New Hampshire. Dusty is in Ohio. Every year Great. I go online and I order my hunting license and fishing license from the New Hampshire State Fish and Game Department. And I, I also get my extra deer tag. I get my bear tag. I get my waterfowl and my hit permit and it costs about one hundred and forty-seven dollars ish thereabouts. Yes, sir. Every year, Dusty, what do you, what do you pay for your license? Uh, it's twenty. It's twenty for the the actual resident hunting license, and then uh, uh, twenty-four for a either sex deal permit that gets you started. Uh, and then you you know you got fishing license and uh, waterfowl tags and you know federal stamp, and it, it can get the hundred dollar bill no problem. Okay, so we're we're north of a hundred bucks easy. On my ticket, though, I never see a tax when they do that. Is that just part of the game, or is it, or is it just something I'm not looking at? Yeah, the mo- most state agencies don't actually tax themselves or don't pay any kind of sales tax uh, on anything. If it's you know if it's a state agency, okay. Whether we're, whether we're buying tires or we're going to Lowe's to get some some wood to build a wood duck house, we don't pay any tax on it. Right. Um, but like on my license, I don't see a line item says. Federal tax for the Pittman Robertson Act. Boom! Here's your your tax. You get to pay to get your hunting license. There's nothing there. So the, the the taxes aren't. I mean, there's a certain amount of money that comes from the hunter's licenses. Still correct. Not from the license. It comes the that tax is is on firearms and right. ammunition, sporting arms and ammunition. It's not on the actual license right. itself. Did they and, abandon uh, the the license altogether? All any of the money that come from the license altogether? Like where they they were originally doing it in in the thirties? That the the, the Pittman Robertson Act cannot be used for any law enforcement activity. Okay. So the hunting license sales is what funds the conservation officers. Got it. Okay. Uh, and now I and what 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 funds the wildlife section and the wild Wildlife Management Department uh, is the Pittman Robertson Act. Gotcha. And and uh, you know we have to do a weekly report every week of week of our activities, and we have about nine codes that we have to code our daily activities out on, depending on what we're doing. Uh, I'm also a conservation officer in Alabama. I'm yeah. a certified wildlife biologist, and, and you know depending on what your activities are for the day, you have to code it so that the accountant knows how to um, distribute the funds. So when you say you code it, this is this is on the the wildlife Wildlife biology side or on the conservation side, conservation officer side. Uh, at, on the on our biologist weekly report that we do, okay. we have to co- we have to code uh, daily activities based on whether we work on management areas or we work for private landowners or we uh, we work in the county enforcing game and fish laws and other activities. There's a number of them. Whether we're doing hunter education, um, you know, you're dealing with government, so you're dealing with a stack of paperwork, and uh, right. uh, you know, that's just all part of it. Yeah, I mean, if it's government, there's going to be a, a bundle of paperwork that goes along with all this stuff, especially if you're receiving f- funds from the Department of the Interior. That's exactly right. Gotcha. Um, Jeff, what inspired you to write the article? You know, it gets back to that truck driver bringing me my seed, and, and that's been a few years ago, and, and I haven't thought about that uh, or haven't forgotten about it. Uh, and uh, I think there's just and, – and running into hunters and individuals in the field that just that just simply don't know – uh, don't know how we're funded. Um, you know, I've taught tens of thousands of hunter education students, and uh, in my PowerPoint presentation, I always make sure they understand that 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 those that hunt, those that fish, those that buy a license and, and guns and ammunition directly pay our salary. Period. And don't be afraid to come and talk to us. We work for you. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have a job. And uh, I'm very customer oriented, as with many of our employees, and and we we have to be that way and need to be that way even more because. 
industry. Um, you know, I mean, if somebody's paying your paycheck, um, you want to you want to serve them as much as you can. Right. So, in order to get the money to Alabama, you need a certain amount of forests. You need a certain amount of uh, licenses sold for hunting and fishing, and then they'll they'll send the money to match the, the That's money. Right. Gotcha. And if you don't get that money, your department suffers. Yes. Yes, it will. Uh, and things would be a lot different. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to manage the wildlife, on, you know, for the public. Right. No, I'm gonna jump in here, Jay. I yeah. got I got a quick question. From 1937 to now, has has the taxes changed any? Has there been an increase in the tax that comes out? That act has not changed. Thank God a bit. Uh, it's it's 11 percent still to this day. Still today, uh, it's 11 percent. Yeah, that that was just a question I had to, to see if it increased at all or if it's pretty much been level the whole way through. That's amazing to think that a tax hasn't changed since 1937. Yeah, to, to my knowledge, that tax has has not changed. Right. And, but, uh, and many, you know, there have been some efforts in the past to um, to to tap in uh, some of that money and use it for other things by some legislators and and others. But uh, uh, conservation groups have stepped up and uh, thankfully have um, have not have put a stop to that in the past, and uh, hopefully will continue to do so. Yeah, that's, that's great. Just a uh, just a question there. That that's very interesting that it hasn't been taxed, as Jay said. It's it's uh, with taxes rising regularly, like they do with uh, any other thing that's taxed. Um, that it's leveled out at eleven percent all this time. Yes, sir. Absolutely that's amazing. Exactly right. So do you see this changing in the future, Jeff? Do you see this kind of maintaining where it is and are guns and ammunition sales um, stabilized enough uh, or increased uh, for whatever reason, whether it be political or, or whatever? Um, do you think that there there's enough gun and ammunition sales to support where we need to go with fish and game management re- and resources? Well, you know, uh, there, there's an awful lot of other things that, that we could be doing if we had more money. I mean, uh, we're, we're thankful for what we've got and, and what we get annually, but there's a number of things that, that we could be could be doing a little different uh, and spending more time on and, and working with other species. But, uh, you know, I think there, that some states have uh, uh, have tacked other items as well, uh, such as binoculars and kind of non-consumptive use items like camping equipment and to help fund their wildlife uh, department, but uh, but currently we're not doing that. Uh, gotcha. But uh, I think um, you know it's with, with the shows, honestly, like Duck Dynasty, and you see Doomsday Preppers, and you know people are trying to get back to the earth. I mean, they're they're you know these things they're they're thinking you know this this could actually happen. Uh, and uh, what would we do? Well, you know we have trapping workshops now that where people are learning how to trap. Uh, you know, and and there's a whole generation that's that's that have hasn't even hunted. And uh, you know, I had a guy just the other day was you know he was 40 years old and had two kids in this truck, and and I ran into him on my area, and he said, man, he said he said I don't even know how to skin a deer. He said, but I'm trying to get back into hunting. Mm-hmm. You know, all these kind of popular shows have got people thinking, and uh, and I said, well, I tell you what, I got to hunt this weekend. If you kill a deer, bring it to me at the check station, and I'll I'll skin it for you and show you how to do it. Right. And believe it or not, he took me up on it. He pulled up there with a grin on his face and uh that, and that's a great story it is it is that's a true story and i've scanned out for him and he was tickled to death and uh and he, he he learned how to do it on his own and and he couldn't thank me enough but uh you know like i told you guys we we work for you uh any way we can help you we need to be doing that right and, and that's out Al- that's alabama's firearms and ammunition ammunition tax at work there yes sir yeah. that's exactly right that's pretty cool because i mean our show wouldn't exist if the act hadn't been put in play, I would imagine. Right, Dusty? Yeah, yeah I'm, th- I'm thinking that, that uh, it, it saved the whitetails, for one, uh, keep them from getting knocked out totally. Right. We wouldn't we wouldn't be having this conversation right now if that were existing. You wouldn't have hunting today in a manner in which you would think it would be. I, I, yeah, I think we'd still be, we, we'd probably be talking squirrel, right. squirrel hunting. Yeah. I don't think you can kill all the squirrels right. out there. There wouldn't be, right. you'd be killing something else, but there wouldn't, we wouldn't have a big buck registry, big buck podcast at all. Um, Duck Dynasty wouldn't exist. So it's kind of feeding itself, but still, I mean, what we're doing here today is to to capture the story, sport, and spirit of big buck deer hunting, and we, we got to know we got to know how it got to that point, right? So we got to know where we came from, but we also need to know where we want to go, and yep. that's what we're doing right now. Is we know that as long as we keep telling the stories, capturing the, the photos, and encouraging the sport to live on. 
then there will be more deer because the money and the taxes will flow back as long as this act stays in place back to the wildlife conservation areas to con- COs and wildlife biology to make sure that those populations around forever for our generations to come and that that michael that money just keeps cycling over and over and over the stories be, get created the energy gets created the hunters go out in the field and they buy more bullets they buy more guns and on and on and on that's exactly right and we appreciate you guys bringing bringing light to this important subject you know and without the biologist as a, as of yourself that with without you none of this is available um, you do your research and help the area to help conservate the area that this wildlife's got to live in you know that they've got to have a home and somebody's got to make sure that it's it's correct for them that's exactly right and uh, you know and I love to share it, you know, love to share it with the family and friends. And, uh, just last week, my daughter shot a deer and that's some of the most, you know, fond memories that I have is his hunting with my son and my daughter and other family members that, as, as well as you guys will understand that for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the kind of story we love to hear. And we like to break it down into the little details about how you even got into the field with your daughter in the first place, all the way through the hunt and, you know, all, along the, with the great feelings and emotions that go along with that. That's what we're trying trying to capture here so that others can relate to the story and that understand that there's a there's a lot of people doing this and that it's it's okay to feel good about this this is a good thing it's, it's uh despite some of the anti-hunters out there this is a good thing oh it, it is absolutely and it, it's great table fare too it's delicious <laughs> it um, is. would you say that uh, hunters are the biggest conservationists out there Bar none, uh, especially wildlife conservation. Uh, if it wasn't for them, you know, again, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. Right. Uh, because they, they pay for it. They support management and conservation efforts throughout the nation. They are the leading conservationists in the nation. And do you think that the hunters realize that when they buy their, their tags, when they buy some bullets, when they buy a new gun? Do you think they realize that they're doing an act of conservation by when they do that? I think probably the majority of them do not, unfortunately, right. realize that. Um, and that, and that, that's pretty sad. And that's the word we need to get out, you know, that they need to know that by buying and purchasing, or, or they're helping out. That, that's exactly right. And uh, thanks to your show and this article and other ways, hopefully more people will come to uh, come to the realization of that. Right. Well, we're going to do the best we can to spread this word and keep it going. And uh, I'll keep my eye out for any of the articles you write, Jeff. And uh, we'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Well, I'd love to come back. And Again, thank you for, for all you're doing for wildlife conservation efforts. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're happy to participate. And if you could, at some point, maybe come back on the show and, and share some hunting experiences, we'd love to hear some of those, too. Sounds great, sir. Thank you. All right, Jeff. I appreciate it. Take care. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, Dusty, what do you think about all that? You know, it makes me look at where I spend my money at and how it benefits the you know wildlife programs. Yep. Um, that was pretty cool. So, you know, it's just one of those things you always take for granted. You don't, you don't even know you're not, you don't know it. It's one of those things. So I thought it was very cool to get that message out. And, you know, if any, any other articles come out that, that you find very interesting, definitely send them along because we'll call up that person and get them to talk more in depth about that subject matter. I think that's one of the things that is unique about the Big Buck Registry is that we're open to all suggestions. So if you want us to cover something, Find this interesting article, forward it along, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and we will make sure that we get to that author or, or whoever's covering that story. We'll get more information about that. And sometimes it just needs a little more detail to make it uh, understandable for the average mind. Yep. Um, let's uh, let's check in with Amanda Lowry. You want to give her a call and see how she's doing on the Extreme Huntress? Yeah, let's call her up out of the blue and, and see how everything's going for her. Awesome. Hi. It's Jay and Dusty from the Big Buck Registry. How are you? We're good. How are you guys? Good. <laughs> We're doing good. We, we thought we'd shout out and see how, you, how your uh, Extreme Huntress event's going. Um, it's going pretty good, actually. Um, well, I keep going back and forth between second and third place on the vote, but um, I had two big articles come out yesterday, um, and that's helping quite a bit. And um, our local news is doing a story on Monday, so nice. hopefully we can catch up by the end. I'm still about 400 and some behind in first place, so I gotcha. have <laughs> a ways to go. <laughs> well, we, uh, we're doing, we just decided to do a little impromptu call here to check in on you, and uh, oh, cool. we got another podcast coming out. Um, yeah, let's see in a couple of weeks. When does the voting end? It ends at midnight on January 1st. Midnight, January 1st. All right. So this, we will actually be airing this um, before January 1st. So 
we'll be able to put it back on our websites and stuff again by making this call and you'll be part of that subject line again. So maybe we can pick up awesome. a few votes for you along the way. Awesome. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. Are you still hunting? Oh yeah. We've got about a week left of late archery and I haven't got to go out a whole lot the last few days, but hopefully this weekend I can get the job done. <laughs> I, I told Jay we may be catching her right in her tree stand tonight. <laughs> no, uh, it just got dark here a little bit ago, so I was just hanging out and watching TV with the kids for the evening. So. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for picking up the phone. We, uh, we'll we we'll check in with you again down the road after uh, January 1st, see how you did. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you guys for calling. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're Have welcome. a good one. You too. Bye, Amanda. Bye-bye. All right, so it sounds like Amanda is doing very well. For sure, you know, wish her the best of luck. And we we let we wish all the extreme hunters finalists the yep. best of luck and uh it won't be long we'll know who is the 2013 extreme huntress. It, yep. It's J- January 1st. Yep. Um I think we're going to let's follow up with her again, but let's push Amanda and see if we can get her some more votes. So, extremehuntress.com forward slash vote Go vote for Amanda Lowry, L O W E R Y. Um, all right, uh, Dusty, I think we need to do a prank call. You know, I, I think I may have a prime candidate. Who do you want to, who do you want to prank? Yeah, let's call my brother, Matt Phillips. Matt Phillips. All right, Matt. Sorry to do this to you, buddy. But. Yeah, sorry, buddy. Uh, you're our first victim and we're going to call you up and, uh, see how your hunt went. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do this. Let's call him. Hello? Hello, is this Matt Phillips? Yes. Hey, Matt, this is Mr. Scott from the Division of Natural Resources. And how are you tonight? Good. Excellent. Uh, I'm just doing a little follow-up call on some trespassing charges that we're following up on. And, oh, uh, really? Yeah. Uh, we're just uh, in doing – this is nothing big. I'm just doing some phone calls tonight. Um, okay. Do you uh, you hunt Venton County at all? Yeah, yeah. You do? Okay. Huh? Um, did you harvest any deer down there this year? Yes, I did. You did. Um, were you using a firearm? No, no. I was using a bow. Okay. All right. Um, Hmm. Do you do you know a Michael Howard? A Michael Howard? Yes. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Um, his vehicle was mentioned in the report. Um, something about a campground. Any of that sound familiar? Um. Uh... Yeah, but I mean, young season. I didn't go with him. I hunted uh, in November. Gotcha. All right. So, you, do you do you recall a trespassing at all? No, no, not at all. Mm, okay. Matt, this is Jay Scott from the Big Buck Registry. I'm here with your brother. We're just busting on uh, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Welcome to the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this will cause some fights at Christmas. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. What do you know? Huh? I said, what do you know? I always just got home from eating dinner. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we're yeah. trying out our first uh, prank phone call on the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast, and you became a victim. Yeah, oh, well, I did. You thought I'd be worried there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh man sorry dusty put me up to it matt oh, jay's, okay. it, was, it was jay's ideal so we had to go with it but uh yeah, you're right. my first victim i know dusty's been been just itching to prank call some people for for other stuff and i, I said <laughs> yeah and we just ended this interview i said dusty who do you want to prank call it goes my brother <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me because I didn't know whose number this was. Yeah, uh, perfect. <laughs> oh, fantastic! All right, sorry about that, Matt, but it was uh, oh. it was fun. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Uh, hey, <laughs> we're good. Right. We're good drinking beer because I know your blood pressure is through the roof. Yeah, I'm a little mad right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, have a good one. I, ch- I think we got him, dude. <laughs> I think you got him. <laughs> Oh, uh, that was funny. <laughs> he was had. Yep. Right he didn't on. know what to say. He didn't know what to say about that. Nope. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm sure he's probably still shaking right now. Yeah. Um, I felt bad doing a little bit, but it was still pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, my Christmas may just got a little more interesting. Jay calling him up like that. Yeah. All right. But you know, uh, you never know, folks. You need to be ready because you may be the next victim of the Big Buck P- Podcast, Big Buck Registry Podcast prank call. Mm-hmm. A new segment that Dusty has invented. <laughs> you know, it's uh, going to be something fun. It's going to be something interesting. And if you got uh, maybe somebody that you want us to reach out to, give us a call. Yep. Um, just uh, th- three other things I want to cover. I'm going to play you three separate thing, three separate call-ins to the Big Buck Hotline. Seven two three seven. What is it? Seven two four six one three two eight two five. And um, they're kind of interesting, Dusty. Like they're just call-ins that people have talked about a big deer that they shot or um, just some feedback about a deer that, that they sent a picture in about. And then there's some feedback about Danny Hottinger and uh, very touching uh, message that we got by voice. So um, I'm just going to cue those up right now. Awesome. You know, we, we, uh, 
push you guys to call us call us up after your your hunt or right after your harvest and from the tree stand give us a phone call yep um, we, we, we love the phone calls we love phone calls and it's not i mean it's not a lot of people do it but it's kind of cool when they do um because it's like we interviewed them but it's like you're in the field with your phone just after the hunt and you're you're, you're all pumped up we want to hear that excitement that's what we're, we live for that's that adrenaline rush that we like to capture on audio we want to hear you feed the need right after you harvest exactly. call us up it, we try to capture that by interviewing you after the hunt several days later, months later. But there is nothing like being within 24 hours of that kill. There's probably nothing better than being on the scene. If you could dial us up for the minute after you walk up to that deer, realize what you have. First thing we want you to do is pick up the phone and call us. Yeah, that's what we want. But if you could call us from the tree stand 10 seconds after you release the arrow, do it. Yeah. So, all right. I think I just got one. That would be very cool. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. Now, I don't have any of those exact ones, but that's what we would love to hear. But we'll take any of them. We'll take any any hunting story you want us to tell us. Call us on the phone. But I do have a couple that I'd like to play. This one came in from Larry, a guy named Larry from last year. And, and this has kind of set the stage for the phone service that we have. Again, 724-613-2825. Let's listen to Larry. Hey, Jay, this is Larry Tatum. I just sent you some pictures of a buck I just shot uh, probably uh, two and a half, middle of November down here in South Florida. Uh, the buck was a 12-point, typical, and uh, right at 190 pounds of weight. Probably going to be the top 10 biggest typical bucks ever killed in Florida. I'm waiting for it to come back from the taxidermist so I can get a, a neck score. It was still uh, under 60 days. They won't give me a scoring on it. So I'm just waiting for it to come back. Hope all goes well. So that was Larry from Florida. Sounds like he, he harvested one heck of a big deer. And again, this is awesome from buck. 2012. But I'd like to follow up with Larry this year to find out how it scored out because I don't think we ever heard the story about what it finally scored to see if it was, in fact, the largest deer ever taken in Florida. What else you got for us? All right. Next one is a guy named Rob Nichols. Hey, guys. My name is Robert Nichols. Uh, I had shot a 11-pointer last night in Grady County, Oklahoma. Uh was hunting with my son. This buck came in following another smaller 8-pointer and 40 yards. Couldn't pass him up. Shot. He uh, ran off. Gave him a little while. Once the fact he didn't even bleed out till he laid down. And shooting a uh, rage hypodermic. Did a lot of damage, but he just didn't bleed out. But... Awesome hunt, awesome buck, my biggest bow buck to date. If you have any problems or questions, give me a call. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the page, too. All right, there you go. That's what we want. Awesome. I shot this deer last night. There's only one thing that could be better than that it is if you could shoot it from your tree stand just after you made the shot. There really is. That's 24. That was a 24 hour call, Dusty. Yeah, he was all jazzed up still. Did you hear it? You can hear it in his voice. You can hear it. It's the <laughs> adrenaline that you can hear in the voice. That's what He's, we love. He still had it 24 right. hours later. Right. I mean, there's nothing like doing this for yourself, but you can live vicariously through others because I can hear that on this show. Uh, that's what we want to hear. Right. Uh, this, this final call in was, uh, from a guy named Whitney and Whitney sent in some feedback about, um, Danny, the, the knife maker that we highlighted on our show the other day. Yes, this is Whitney from Federal Tennessee. I was calling to give you some feedback on Mr. Danny with Amber Creation Custom Knives. Uh, had an experience with Mr. Danny about three years ago with my seven year old boy. He, uh, Survivor of leukemia won one of Mr. Danny's knives at a uh, kids hunting for a cure event for killing a big buck and a uh, very very good quality knife. Uh, we're still friends with Mr. Danny and Miss Stephanie. Look forward to seeing them here soon. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know it is a great knife to have to go hunting with and use around the house. Thank y'all for your time. That gave me cold chills, Jay. Doesn't it? It's that just, was very cool. This makes you feel great. Yeah, big shout out to Danny Hottinger. Absolutely. Danny Hottinger, thank you very much for being on our show and changing people's lives. That's uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that was very cool. Yep. And, and this is the kind of feedback we'd like to hear from you guys out there. Uh, pick up your phone. You know, if you're di if you're driving to your hunting site, give us a call. Tell us what you're doing, where you're going, what you hope to find when you get there. Um, call us about the big deer you just shot. Tell us about how a hunting experience changed your life. Uh, all those things we want to hear on the Big Buck Registry, we'd like to start playing some more of these. So if you have a, a second, give us a call at 724-613-2825. You know, even if you've missed a monster, you've been hunting this big deer forever, and you and you made a bad shot and you missed him, tell, tell us all about it. You know, yeah. We, we want to hear everything. Yeah, or even if you've got this big deer on camera and you're going in, give us a daily catalog, you know, a daily journal. 
Um, all right, this is, uh, you know, day one, day two, didn't see anything, a lot of squirrels, nothing was moving, whatever. If you want to do that, we'll, we'll play it each and every time on the Big Buck Registry to find out what people are doing across the country. Because this is another element of saving and preserving those hunting stories that's a piece of Americana that is the sole purpose why we're here today. Uh, so Danny Hodger, we, we give a shout out to you again. Uh, Antler Creations, Custom Knives. Look him up on Facebook. You know, Jay, it's been a great show. We've had a lot of fun. We've yeah. uh, been, we, we started out pretty interesting yep. and we ended on a, on a funny note with calling my brother, you know, yeah. shout out to you, Matt, for picking up the phone. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We're going to do some more of that because yeah. I enjoy it and it, give, it, it gives us kind of something we can cut up a little bit about. It's been a kind of a emotional roller coaster type of show where we started out very serious and about you know federal funds and then we went to prank calling and then we went to um, some very uh, deep emotional inspiration from Danny Hottinger so it's been, uh, been an interesting show today yeah I think next time we're going to call uh, one of Jay's friends and uh, get them on the phone and see if we can uh, get their blood pressure raised up a little bit nice all right let's do it all right so uh, how can we reach you Dusty Face- www.facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoor Excellent. And this is Jay Scott, and you can reach me by emailing me at j at bigbuckregistry.com. You can always call the show for feedback, and anything else you want to send our way is uh, 724-613-2825. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. Our Twitter handle is Big Buck Registry, and our website is www.bigbuckregistry.com. And you can find us on pretty much every major podcast directory. This is an internet radio show broadcast every single week at 5 a.m. on Saturday mornings. And you can find us on Blueberry. You can find us on iTunes. If you have an Apple device, you can find us on Microsoft. You can find it on the Microsoft Xbox app. You can find us on Stitcher, Blueberry, um, probably double saying some of these things, but we're on a lot of podcast directories. So um, we're getting out there. We're, we're definitely getting out there. And if you want to share it, you can always push the, an arrow. Uh, you, there's all kinds of share options when you're listening to these shows, no matter what directory you're on. Hit the share button, post it on your Facebook page, post it on your Twitter account, send an email to your best friends that love to hear about deer hunting and different things that are going on in the country and that somebody that would in, in like to hear the stories um, that we, we're preserving here at the Big Buck Registry. So uh, I think that's a wrap, Dusty. Awesome. We look forward to the next show and uh, you guys getting out in the woods still be safe out there. Absolutely. All right. This is Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Can't wait. Can't wait.